you should see the mail we get on that. I got a mail letter this two days ago from a, a couple who lost their baby stillborn that go to this music, go to this poem about how to deal with the loss of a child um, and my setting of it. And so what we are doing is important, so deeply important. And I, I'm nourished every day by going to choral concerts, by seeing what you people and others do, uh, going to places of beauty, of silence, of quietness, and reading poetry. All of this is great inspiration to me. Wonderful, thank you. I'm Shelly, I'm also um, an elementary music educator and what you just said goes right into my question. We were wondering um, where did your love of poetry begin? Because you've set so many beautiful poems, we figured you probably love poetry. <laughs> yes, I do. Well, my love of poetry, my love of words began uh, with studying art, art songs, really. Uh, uh, when I was growing up, the songs of Schubert, Schumann, Brahms, the, the classic literature, looking at the, the uh, poets that have set them, and also another great influence on me, to the poetry of those great lyricists for the Broadway stage. Um, I love music of the Broadway stage, and you can see that <clears throat> the long melodies, timeless melodies, and lyrics that those composers and lyricists have left us in this quintessentially American medium have deeply infected my own music. I love people who are able to write a long lyric melody that, that stays with you. And certainly that group of, of composers, Richard Rogers, you know, Cole Porter, Jerome Kern, all those people. I love this music deeply. Look at Shining Night. Look at my song for Shining Night. That's a long lyric melody. Look at some of the other ones that I that I have written. Dilray Tone six in your in your ear. Some I get a lot of mail on that one. I can't get it out of my ear. What do I do? <laughs> and I write them back and I say, "There's nothing you can do, man." I <laughs> I wrote it to go in, not to go out. And uh, so I'm very very sorry about that. But those kind of melodies that we hang on to that that are in a sense timeless. I, I admire that. And so this is what I've been doing. And you've written in quite a few languages as well. How do yeah. the different languages influence your um, compositions? Yeah, listen, I am not a linguist by any sense, but I want to set these wonderful poems in the original, original language. I admire great, great uh, translators very, very much, but it's an imperfect art, isn't it? One of the great books that I have is uh, Reading Rilke. <clears throat> and uh, I think, yeah, I forgot the, the, the author, Poulon perhaps, um, takes a, a line from Rilke and, and gives it to 20 different translators and have them, have them translate and they're all different. Uh, I want the sound of the original language I want to set it. I want to set Neruda in Spanish, Rilke in French, the Latin in the original Latin, um, Lorca in Spanish, the, the text I chose for the Madrigali in Italian. So listen, it's taken me a lot of extra innings to do this, a lot. I study it, I get together with experts on that. I have, I, I, I work with them very, very closely on getting the right accentuation and the right, everything about it. It takes extra innings. I, I'm not, uh, I studied French uh, a long time ago. And so that helped me with the uh, with setting Rilke. Because French is a very, very complicated language as you well know. As you well know, uh, if you're gonna do the, the row songs, for example, you have to, as one uh, conductor said, add at least 40% more rehearsal time simply for the language. It's very, very difficult to do. But, so I, I've been taken into areas that uh, were unknown to me and simply because I loved those texts and I wanted to give what I thought was honored to the poets to set it as they originally composed it. Thank you. So I, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, piggyback off of you were talking about musical theater, which is something that is hugely important in my life. And 
also as actually Shelly and Vicky and I were all watching the documentary on you this weekend. And you also mentioned a lot of folk rock artists that yeah. made impressions on you. And we're, we were actually really curious as to whether or not you've written either musical theater pieces or folk type pieces that you may or may not have published or have shared with the world because. No, yeah. just, just one. Uh, musical theater type piece, and that's my my uh, my cabaret song. Where have the actors gone? And uh, if you haven't listened to that, uh, try and get a. Uh, it's recorded by Shelley Berg, the great uh, uh, pianist, and Sonny Wilkinson, the great jazz artist. And it is an allegory of uh, a play ending. Where have the actors gone? And I, and I wrote the text. I wrote it back in 1974, it was coming off a bum sort of relationship then. It was my way of saying goodbye to that. So it's really about me saying goodbye to uh, a relationship. I wrote the words. It is the very first piece recorded on the Northwest Journey uh, recording. See if you can hear that somewhere. It's hard to get a hold of that one now, uh, but it might be Sonny Wilkinson. Um, I, I'm as fond of that, that cabaret song as anything I've ever written. I love it. So next life, I'll probably write musicals. I love musicals so much. Look, I was, I was raised upon this stuff. I mean, you go back to the great Rogers Hammerstein. Oh, each time I, I go to, to Pennsylvania, which is quite often Doylestown, I stay at his home, Oscar Hammerstein's farm. It's now B and B, and they've got his uh, personal objects around the house. His typewriter, a lot of photos. My God, you go you go around that house and you hear, "Younger than springtime, are you?" This nearly was mine. Oh, what a beautiful morning! And just all of these timeless, timeless pieces that are deeply inspiring to me. So this is a part of my. Uh, my life, uh, continuing part of my life, and I will put those composers right up with the, all the classical art song writers. Hi, I'm Vicki, and uh, I'm the third person for today, also a public school music teacher. Uh, you mentioned- you? <laughs> you yeah. mentioned, oh, sorry, what was that? Yes, I said, good, good for you. Listen, <laughs> so important. Listen, when I was in grade school, I was inspired I'll never forget when uh, some fellow came and he, he demonstrated soprano saxophone to our class and it got me wanting to, 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 to join in an ensemble. And uh, my father went out and bought me a trumpet so I was able to, to, to play in that. But those early years are so important. I started playing piano when I was eight, but to play in an ensemble and to participate in a school in Oregon, both uh, grade schools and high schools that had very fine music to, uh, programs were very important to me. And of course it breaks our heart, isn't it? When, when so many of them are eliminated these days. Well, thank you. I, it means a lot knowing that uh, somebody <laughs> who got as far as you did still is thanking their elementary music teachers. <laughs> that means a lot. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned, uh, you mentioned a few pieces that have really struck out to audiences um, over the years who have messaged you, emailed you, written you about how they've connected with your music. And um, I was wondering if there's a piece of yours that has deepened or changed its meaning to you in a surprising way over the years. Well, I don't know how to answer that really. I'll tell you every piece of mine, um, I go into very deeply in, into the lyrics. This is something that I find occasionally, actually more than occasionally, that uh, choral conductors don't spend enough time with the lyrics. Anytime that you're gonna conduct a piece of music that has words, the very first thing that any conductor should do is to become experts on that poem, on that text. Find out everything you can about the author of the text. Find out everything you, possibly can about the meaning of the text. And then go to the music and see how, how it relates to the text. That's very important. 
if you're going to do my midwinter songs on, on poems by Robert Graves, for example, it's very important that you get deeply into those texts. I have five, five songs, all with a winter theme, but they also trace his relationship life through in all five of them. Uh, the, the first one, he's just been dumped by his longtime uh, lover, uh, Laura Riding. And he's angry and he's just beside himself. And so there's a lot of angst in this thing. Dying sunshine, warm a little longer. He's losing his mind. He's so sad and, and upset. And then the second one, he turns her into a piece of ice. And so the music becomes very crystalline. And the third one, he finds new love in, in the form of Burl Hodge. And all the edges are gone. The, the harmonies warm up, the, the angles are gone. The, the uh, complex rhythms are gone. And the, and the fourth one, the poem is stirring suddenly from long hibernation. I found myself once, once more a poet. And at the end of the poem, he says, and found no winter anywhere to see. And so it's very light and gay and jazzy and all this kind of stuff. And then the last one is a prayer to keep his heart from being busted again. And uh, I set that as a, as, well, very quiet thing, but I also bring back the opening of that, the very dramatic opening, because as Graves knew, and this was a theme throughout his work, grab it while you can, oh love be fed with apples while ye may, because it could be snatched away from you in an instant. And this is a theme through all his work, and he found that out firsthand when he got plugged in the First World War, and they thought he was dead and he barely survived. And, and so all of these things are so important. And so you get into this kind of thing, then you go to the music. And so in all of my music pieces, I have gone very deeply into all of it. I've gone into the history. I love that. Look, I've got eight vocal cycles out there and all of them are as different from night and day. Look at the difference between the Luke's and Terna, for example, and my completely atonal and very edgy setting of Lorca. Poems by, by night and time, uh, not night and time, or the, the rose songs, which reflect in so many ways the time that it was written, the poems were written of the early uh, uh, 20th century, Debussy and Ravel are very much reflected there, or the Luke's Terna that references the, the Renaissance, the high Renaissance of Joscan and these kind of procedures or the Monteverdi influences found in the Madrigali. I love this kind of stuff. I love to tie my music in with the past and bring it new freshness in a new contemporary way in, in our own time. And I think one of, the pop, one of the reasons that this music of mine has gotten so popular is that I chose texts very, very, very carefully that relate to all of us we can relate to, to light eternal. Whether you're uh, religious or not, makes no difference at all because it's it, light eternal shining upon them. And light eternal can also refer to intellectual light, artistic, enlightenment, all of these things. And look at Dana's poem, Prayer, go to that. You gotta find out, gotta read that poem. You can find, go to Dana Joya, G-I-O-I-A is the, his last name. He, he's a national hero. He ran the, uh, the national uh, uh, arts for us um, for seven years under Bush and um, award-winning poet. Go to him, Dana Joy, you can see him reading prayer on this extraordinary poem about how to deal with the death of his son. And you get into this kind of thing where he, he speaks in this poem, there are all these edgy sort of things at the start. You don't know quite where he's going. And at the very end of this thing, he's asking God or nature or the spirits or whatever to watch over his little boy for him. As a mountain guards its covert oar and the harsh falcon its flightless young. Don't get any better than that. Go to love poems. You, if you want to score with your, your favorite person in the world, read them some Neruda love poems. When I die, I want your hands upon my eyes. I want to feel their freshness. One more time. And at the end of that poem, and it says, go on and live. 
live, blossom. And I'm waiting for you. And in the meantime, everyone's going to know the reason for my song. It doesn't get any better than that. It simply doesn't. And I read this stuff every single day. Oh, as we were watching the documentary this weekend, actually the, the piece in the documentary where you were talking about the Pablo Neruda, Shelley and I were both just sobbing and right. it just, it, it touched us so much. Um, but that also brought up for us wondering being creative people and knowing that the creative process is constantly changing, but is there any piece that you've ever created that in retrospect, you wish you had composed in some different way to create something different, or I'm, I'm talking in circles right now, but I got a little verklempt right there, but you know, is there something you wish you had redone in some way? Only very early pieces, you know, student works. Um, I look back on those, those pieces though. Look, I got a song cycle called A Winter Come. I wrote that when I was 24 years old. I wouldn't change a note of it. I got a crumpet sonata. I would probably revise some of that, but it was a learning piece and I, it, it shows somebody growing as a composer. But look, I must tell you, I spend, I'm very self-critical. I spend an enormous amount of time on each piece. I worked on Old Mining Mysterium for six months until I got it right. That was a very, very, very hard piece to write. And those of you who have gone to mortonlordson.net, there's a 7,000 word essay on my comp composing O Manu Mysterium and its relationship to the painting by Zubaran from the Baroque that showed me the way, the pathway as to how to approach that text, two lines of text. It's a very insightful article by Dr. Bond. And I, I urge you to, to write that, uh, read that article. Go to the mortonlordson.net and you'll find it in the news section. The whole thing is re reprinted there. Um, anyway, carry on. What, what's the next one? You have there? We were also um, just wondering, when you decided to become a composer, is this what you imagined? What were you imagining your life would be like when you first decided to compose? Yeah, well, this may be interesting to those of you who don't know much about me. Uh, I didn't compose, aside from some, some little tiny pop tune type things that weren't worth anything, just for fun. I didn't compose anything in what we would con consider real composing until I was a junior in college. Uh, it's very, very interesting to me, that particular history. I went off to Whitman College. I didn't take any music classes at all, thinking I, it would be an avocation. I was a good pianist. I was a better than average trumpet player, but I didn't want to do that, uh, have a life as a performer. I just didn't want to do that. So I simply went off to uh, Witty and took other classes. Uh, I have got lots of interests, you know, English, history, you, you know, I'm a sponge for all sorts of stuff. And then I got posted on that lookout for 10 weeks alone up there. And I, I made the realization that I needed to make music a much bigger part of my life. And I didn't know in what way that was going to be. But what I decided to do was to get off that tower, go back to Whitman, take every music class I could. Choir. Very fine course there, a guy named Ken Schilling was great. Uh, theory, oral skills, history, piano, everything possible. Then I made the decision that if I were to go into music, I felt that I needed to go to a larger school in a larger urban area because I didn't know my pathway. If I had stayed at Whitman, uh, which had a very small music department. It would have been essentially a piano major and I didn't want to do that. So uh, certain of my friends in Los Angeles had recommend USC. Uh, the USC School of Music is uh, renowned. They had Heifetz down there, Piata Gorsky and, and other notables. Uh, and they were, gonna, they were gonna go to school there and they said, check, out, check it out. So I f actually flew down there, went to classes, checked it out. 
It's in Los Angeles. I want to hear concerts. I want to, I want to be able to pick and choose any night I want to go and hear concerts. So I met with a, 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 a very fine composer and author whose name most of you won't recall, but you should know. His name is Halsey Stevens. Uh, you choristers will know his setting of Go Lovely Rose that was done in the 1930s that he wrote for his wife. And he's got several other choral publications out there, but he also wrote the first book on Bartok, The Life and Music of Be Bela Bartok. Went out and learned Hungarian, get, get to the primary sources in that. It came out in 1953. I met with Dr. Stevens and I will never forget this meeting. So here I, I am, I'm a green thing from Oregon coming down there. And I went with him and I said, you know, uh, Professor Stevens, I, I'm gonna transfer down here. I don't know my path musically, but one thing I, I would be interested in exploring is composition. And he said, great. He says, let's see your portfolio. Well, it didn't exist. I hadn't written anything. And he looked at me quite aghast. And he said, you know, the people we allow into these very small classes, they're composition majors. We don't have classes for uh, in composition for non-majors. Uh, he said, I'll tell you what, let me, let me hear you play the piano. And luckily I had the Brahms E flat Rhapsody in my fingertips. So I played that or at least part of it for him. He fired a bunch of questions and then he looked at me for a long time. He says, I'll tell you what, you're coming a long way. I will give you one semester in a very beginning composition class to see if you can cut the mustard. Well, I succeeded him as chair of the composition department eventually. Uh, within two years, I had a published trumpet sonata, a published choral piece, a song cycle. They gave me an assistantship. There was a big enough place I could I could study with. I studied with four different composers down there, and uh, they broke a, a rule of not hiring their own graduates. And when I when I got my doctorate, they hired me full time faculty. And uh, can you imagine going down there? being put in a beginning composition class, not having composed, and then chairing that department for a lot of years, founding the advanced studies program in film scoring, which is outstanding. That, that program, I found it in the mid eighties. There's no finer one in the whole wide world. Set that up, so many things. And when I got the national medal, it was a great reflection on the university because I got all my degrees there. And they were, of course, thrilled that I got the National Medal of Arts. That was surreal. Before. Can you imagine? I'm back there. There are seven of us in the White House. And I'm with Les Paul. Henry Steinway. Andrew Wyeth. I mean, you know. And I always thought that that was a great tribute to the importance of choral music in our society. I just felt that, that I was representing all of what you people are doing and how important choral music is uh, for the American uh, American culture. It was a great moment for me. It was just unforgettable. Thank you. Um, so I don't know if this is top secret or not, but uh, are there any compositions in progress or any future compositions that you're rolling around in your head that you'd be able to tell us about? And if that's the case, uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about who or what has inspired these compositions. Yeah, well, actually it is top secret. <laughs> I, I, I have composed a work that's gonna be premiered next year, but they wanna keep it under wraps. They haven't announced it yet. So I can't tell you anything more about it right now. Sorry. Charades, first words. Huh? <laughs> okay. Well, we, we tried, we had to try. We went back and forth on that one and I really wanted to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, look, look at, uh, uh, so I'm living on this island up here. I'm very, very active. I've done over a hundred residencies. I love doing them as Brad knows. That was just so great coming down there to, uh, to, to work with you and then to uh, your, your kindness in naming a scholarship after me and, and getting some funds for your great singers down there. That was fabulous. And he did absolutely outstanding performances of my work in Albuquerque. And uh, I've done, as I said, well over a hundred of these things. Uh, I love it. I go there for four or five days to a university, work with them uh, in a number of ways. Uh, 
give individual composition lessons, rehearse, give lectures to the history people, do whatever they want. I'm more than happy to do that. I love to get involved right away. And uh, then leading to a big concert of my music. And I accompany a lot of these things at the piano, of course. And uh, so I, I have, although I've retired from USC, I, I always do four to six of these things every year. And I've got uh, uh, four of them scheduled for this coming year. And I'm very much looking forward to that. It gives me an opportunity to go all, all over the place to meet with choir, choir conductors that know my music, love doing this stuff. So I'm living now on a beautiful home here. I'm, as we talk, I'm looking across the Salish Sea. I'm on a, a home on five and a half acres. Uh, I think on the Facebook page that uh, Michael Stillwater runs for me, I, there are some pictures of my home here. And I'm looking right across to Canada, the Salish Sea towards Victoria. It's just so beautiful living here, but it gives me an opportunity to uh, uh, stay, to uh, fly from the little airport here to Seattle and then fly anywhere in the world and uh, continue my teaching, rehearsing, working. Of course, I still work very much with the LA Master Chorale. I was their first composer in residence. They've done incredible performances of my music over the years and working so closely with the great Paul Solomonovich um, who uh, I went to, to write pieces for him that were right up his alley. Same church job for 60 years at a Catholic church, an expert on Renaissance music, an expert on Gregorian chants. So guess what? Omania Mysterium. That was the first piece I wrote in that position. And then the Lux Eterna and the Ave Maria. And then they recorded that Grammy nominated uh, CD of my music. Uh, if you don't know the story, you, you younger people don't know, you, you've heard the name Paul Solomonovich. He's right with that generation, of course, of Roger Wagner, um, uh, Robert Shaw. He's now deceased. Oh, absolutely wonderful man. Um, he got nailed by a mosquito that had West Nile virus. And he went into coma. He was in a coma for months. And I was up on the islands up here. And when I got off the islands, I went down to see him. So I go and visit him in his hospital. So there's Paul lying there. He's in his mid eighties, got every tube known to God man lying there. He's not moved, he's not responded. He's being kept alive by things. His wife is there, nurse is there. He's not acknowledging anything. So I go up to him and you'll love this. I go up to his ear. And I say, Paul, your composer is here. Please wake up, get well. Let's go on stage again as we used to. And you will conduct O Mania Mysterium and Lux Eterna. And when I said those words, his right hand goes up, attached to all the tubes, and he starts making conducting gestures while in a deep coma. Can you believe that? His wife says, he's not moved. The, the uh, nurse comes running out. He's not moved. What's going on? I said, he's conducting my music. <laughs> That's what's going on. Anyway, and he died shortly after that. I pictured, picture him conducting choirs of angels wherever he is up there. It's great inspiration to me. So I wrote to his strengths and I wrote to the special sound that he got with the LA Master Crowd. What a joy it was for me. He told me he had waited his entire life for this music and he got it from me. That is so incredibly inspirational. And I think it's wonderful to hear who inspires you uh, as you inspire so many people and how the importance of perseverance and dedication are so important to your composing. Do you have any additional words of wisdom to share with? We have so many professional and amateur musicians in this wonderful group that we have. We have choral conductors and instrumentalists and, and you name it, we've got it in our group. We have doctors and, but people who want to compose, do you have any words of wisdom for them? Yeah, uh, forge ahead. Listen, I, I, I started uh, a songwriting class at USC 
everyone was, everybody's got some sort of song in their heart. And so years ago, before I became chair of the golf department, I started a class for uh, people from any walk of life who wanted to write, write music. It was great. God, I had, uh, I had physicists in there and speech majors and everything else. It was great. Give it a shot. You've got nothing to lose. And forge ahead. And, and for, for all of you budding composers up there, you know, listen to your own heart and don't worry about fashion or any of that kind of stuff. Just don't do it. Write what you feel, learn, study. God, I just studied so many. So I had, look, here I am, I'm, I'm in my 20s and I'm in a, been a, a composition class with people who've been writing music since they were conceived. You know, I had a long, long way to go. And so I spent half my life in a library studying scores. You study and also back it up with craft. Try and, and develop as many technical skills as one can. Study your counterpoint. Oh, that was so important to me. Look, the importance of every note against every other note. Study melodic writing, study lyricism. <clears throat> when I'm writing a piece of music, I spend a great, I'm thinking about you, the conductor, every voice. I'll sit down with a piece of mine and I say, I'm an alto. Would I want to sing this piece that I just wrote? And if, if I sing through that line and I, and I, after that, and I think, no, I don't, I'll revise it. I'll get it. So, yeah. Yeah. I want to spend some time rehearsing this. I want to dive into this tough stuff and, and uh, learn the language and spend some time to rehearse this. And the text means meaning things to me. So you have to do it, study very, very hard. I did. And I've, I've got to tell you, in all, in all honesty, composition comes very hard for me. Uh, I, I feel like when I finish a piece, I feel skinned alive. It's just, I, I wrote thousands of notes that were never, never end up in the Omani Mysterium. The idea was to, to get something on the very, in, in the article that I commended to you to write, recommended to you to write, read, uh, post on, on my web, web page. <clears throat> Try and write a piece of music on those two lines of text that have been set by most major composers over centuries that would have a profound effect upon the listener and on the performer. How do I do that? How do I tie it into history? And that's all explained in this long article. But, and I want to use the, the most direct materials possible. And so I use basically, you know, primary triads in that, that armor. And uh, yeah, God, that was hard. So it's a matter of deleting, deleting, deleting to take a football size uh, field of notes. And, and, and get it down to so you can put it in your hands. That was it. And that was a very tough piece for me to do. I mean, the hardest thing is you will know if you don't know Omani, Mr. If I'm gonna do this, if I'm gonna make a, a direct statement about celebrating the birth of Christ in the manger amongst the lowly shepherds, amongst the meek and the animals, what am I gonna do about the Virgin Mary who saw her son murdered? How can I portray her sorrow and her grief in this particular melodic, harmonic, and rhythmic palette I've set up. I lost a lot of sleep on that one, I'll tell you, until one night lying in bed, got it, got it. And you know what I'm talking about. It's a G sharp in the altos. It's the only note out of the key in that piece of music on the word Virgo. It creates a dissonant, a 9-8 over the bass, a 2-3 against the sopranos. It, res it resolves into a minor F-sharp chord. It very subtly, but importantly, shines an oral spotlight on that word, edifying its meaning. I get mail on that note over the years. It's the most important note in the piece. Things like that. Takes me a long time to figure this stuff out. <laughs> I'm a slow learner, but I just plug at it. The idea is to plug at it. And you will hit walls. I hit walls all the time. 
and I try and go around them or bash them down some way. And I'm trying to get a spark that's, that's gonna take me on and something like that. That was a great big wall for me. What am I gonna do here? And then finally I can do it with a single note. With a single note, I can portray the sorrow of the Virgin Mary. Think like that. Persevere. And don't listen to anybody else. Don't, don't, look, if you're gonna be an artist of any sort, get prepared to be shot down. There are always these piss ants out there that are gonna do something negative about whatever you do. Don't, don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> Hell with them. Forge ahead. Forge ahead. Be prepared for failure and learn from the failures. If it doesn't work out, do some, you know, improve, improve it somehow. But forge ahead. It's your life, not theirs. It's what you want to do, not what they want you to do. Be tough. You have to in the, in the art world. You simply have to be tough. Well, I have to say, I think I speak for everyone uh, in saying that we're very grateful that you persevered and forged ahead so that we could be gifted with your wonderful music. Um, and one thing that I think, and I know <coughs> other people think, is that uh, you're, you're a modern day composer who will be performed well after any of our lifetimes. Um, and I was wondering, what do you hope will be said about your music in 100, 200 years from now? Well, look, the music that we, that we dearly love, that has survived, has made an impact on us. And I simply hope that my music has enriched the life of people who listen to it, who perform it in some way, in a, in a, in a, in a very positive way. I hope people will, will get into this music, will remember this music, will be affected by this music uh, in the future. I think some of my pieces are, are gonna last for, for, for a while, for sure. And uh, as I said before, <clears throat> they were written under, you know, look, 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 look at the music I was writing, have written as a student. You know, I'm in the student of the 60s and the 70s where writing a melodic line or writing anything tonal in academia was very much frowned upon. You were dead meat. I didn't care about that. I didn't care about any of that kind of stuff. Serialism is, is in, in the dust heap of, of history right now. But I was right in the thick of listening to all the words between being a tonal composer or a serial composer. You just don't pay attention to those kind of things. You don't pay attention when someone has no um, belief in you. Starting with my own parents. Check this out. When I left Whitman College, I told my parents that I was going to transfer down to the University of Southern California, go down to Los Angeles to try in some way to be, be a musician, a music major. You think that they were happy about that? I didn't hear any heels clicking at that one. In fact, as I was going into my, getting into my 1953 Buick to drive down from Portland, Oregon to Los Angeles, my mother's parting words to me were these, which still ring in my ear after half a century. When it doesn't work out, you can always come home and eat crow. <laughs> and I told her this. I, I, I remember telling her this. I might fail. I mean, I would, I would suggest that a large, hugely large percentage of people that go down to Los Angeles or New York, Chicago or any of these Nashville, to become a successful artist in the arts, of one way or the other, as an actor, a composer, a performer, whatever. They fail. There's a lot of competition out there. And for whatever reason, they fail. I said, but I'm not going to look back on my life as an old man and saying, why didn't I have the guts as a young guy to go down and give it a shot? I'm not gonna look back and say, why didn't I do this? I said, I'm gonna give it a shot. May not work out. If it doesn't work out, I'll do something else. I'm not a fool. I have a lot of interests. I love English, I love, I, I have a lot of interests. 
but I'm going to go down there. There's something inside of me that I learned as a kid on a lookout for 10 weeks, 19 years old, trying to decide what I'm going to do with my life. And the answer was music. I'm going to try and make a, a go in music. And the best thing for me is to try and go to a place that I think I can learn a great deal from and a place where I can hear concerts constantly. And I'm going to give it my best shot. So I struggled. I lived in the ghetto there for five years. I didn't have any money at all. It was a nightmare. Running out of gas all the damn time. Ugh, it was just, anyway, persevering, persevering. And then I also told her that whatever happens, Crow ain't on my menu. I wish she were alive today. That would have been nice. Well, Martin, I, uh, I think I speak for everybody when I thank you from the bottom of my heart. This has been a hard time for us. You know, we were I know. to perform in uh, April and May and we shut everything down in March. And now we thought we might be able to do something this fall. And we've gotten new restrictions just today from the governor. No. So, but, you know, spending time with somebody of your depth and caliber has been a real shot in the arm for me personally and for all of us I know. I, I want to say thank you to the trio of ladies, Vicki, Kristen, and Shelley, who came up with such wonderful questions. And, um, you know, I, I feel that we know each other a bit, you and I, I'm proud to say that. And I, I thought, well, I might not come up with the best questions. Uh, so uh, uh, I asked these ladies if they would uh, take uh, this responsibility and they took it very seriously and I think they did a great job. So They did a great job. And I'll, I must say, it's a great joy for me to, to talk with you. As you can imagine, all the performances, you know, I'm connected with the LA Master Corral. I mean, all these, these uh, courses everywhere, it's a very, very bad time for all of us. And so we simply band together. We do what we can. We do things like you have put together tonight. And, uh, and we'll persevere. At some point, we'll get back uh, by this and back to making music that we all love. In the meantime, we have to persevere in some way. And this has been a, a great joy for me, simply to talk with you, my colleagues, and with people, as I said earlier on, that have inspired me to continue to write music that makes a difference in people's lives. Yeah, it certainly has. And, and I'm going to close on a personal note that I think the chorus will particularly enjoy. Our beloved uh, Marianne Ibarra, who's on tonight and um, our accompanist, she and I first really met and worked together when I was guest conductor in Santa Fe and we did the midwinter songs. And Marianne, hasn't it been fun to uh, hear straight from the source about those songs we worked so hard on six or eight years ago? And now here it comes full circle and Marianne, uh, without Marianne, I don't know where we'd be with Coral Luke. So thanks for that too, Morton. You're very welcome. And that's a very, yeah. Your audio went out, I think. Okay, let's see. There we go. Is it now I can hear you again. Got okay. covered, maybe. All right. Uh, Mac Wilberg was a student at USC, the pianist for the USC Chamber Singers. And when I wrote the Robert Graves setting, I went to him and I said, Mac, this is going to be a piece for piano and chorus. I'm going to give you solos. It's going to be a very, very healthy piano piece. And of course, he performed it beautifully. And then I orchestrated that. I saw Mac a couple of years ago when I had a residencies in Utah. He's, of course, conducting the Mormon Tabernacle Choir and we reminisced on that. So once again, it's been a joy being with you all. I wish you all the best and perhaps our, our, our lives will uh, cross in person at some point when all this stuff gets cleared up. I hope so. Thanks so much. And I'll say good night to everybody. Uh, look for emails about what we're doing in the future, but thanks a million to Dr. Morton Lordson. Thank you so much. You bet. Good night, everybody. Bye. Good night. Thank you.